<laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Lida. And I bet quite a few of you haven't heard that name before. Lida. It's not very common. It has its roots in mythology, actually, but my mom specifically was inspired by the poem Lita and the Swan by the famous Irish poet W.B. Yeats when naming me. Um, and I find it to be quite a fitting name, actually. Not because of what it means in ancient Greek, because I don't speak ancient Greek, nor because of anything about the mythological Lita herself. Rather, I think it's representative of the way that storytelling and art sort of permeates every part of my life. I have a clinically overactive imagination, quite literally, actually. Um, it's a symptom of my autism. Hello, I'm autistic, by the way. Let's get that out in the air. <laughs> because of this, and due to the fact that mm, as a young child, I wasn't really great at socializing with my other peers, I learned very early on to find a home in fiction. TV, books, movies, comics, all of that. It kept me company when I didn't really want it from anyone else or when nobody else wanted it from me. This actually led me down the path to where I am now. I'm an aspiring writer, hoping to one day, fingers crossed, work in the film and television industry. And I maintain that imagination and creative thinking are not only integral to my life personally, but to all of our lives in some way as a collective whole. And a lot of people think that that sounds silly. What does an accountant need an imagination for? What's he imagining? Tax returns? I wouldn't know, I've never paid taxes before. But <laughs> I'd argue that storytelling, art, imagination, general creativity, they're a really big part of human experience and history and very often overlooked. And I'm mainly going to be talking about myself when I try to make this point, but first I would like to ask you all a question. What is a story? Think about it. It sounds easy, but it can actually be tricky to define, depending on who you're talking to. I mean, the dictionary defines a story as an account of real or imaginary people told for the purposes of entertainment. But should we really be counting the time my dad says he nearly got beat up in a ski lodge, uh, or the time my uncle says he used public radio to prank his coworker as stories? I mean, they're narratives, but they're just recollections of memory. They don't involve real imagination, so. As fun as they are, we'll put them to one side for a moment. What's the first fictional story? That's easier to find out than you might think. Most scholars agree that that's the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is this tale from Babylonian mythology about a king who tries to become a mortal. Put a pin in that. Um, there's also the Homeric epics, uh, the Iliad, the Odyssey, there's the poems of Ovid, all of which I get my name from. But Again, those are slightly complicated. They were once living religions. They still are religions to some people in different parts of the world, so put them to one side, but we'll come back to them. What's the first novel? That sounds really easy, right? It's not. <laughs> it just depends on who you're asking. Some people would say it's the tale of Genji, and other people would say it's Don Quixote, it's novels that are centuries apart. But what do all these have in common? What am I getting at? Well, let's take a look. There's Don Quixote, that's 17th century. Um, Tale of Genji, that's 11th century. Uh, the Homeric Epics, 3,000 years ago, give or take. And the Epic of Gilgamesh, more than that, well over BC. Um, and if I were to put it eloquently, stories are old as hell. <laughs> and the commonality is their age. I mean, the history of stories and art in general, it spans all the way from cave paintings up to pretentious all white canvases that you kind of roll your eyes at when you see them in big fancy art museums. These stories stay alive because we work to keep them alive. We retell them in oral tradition for generations and then we write them down for preservation. And then we retouch those pages as they decay away in archives and now we're preserving these stories digitally after having translated them into other languages, adapted them into new mediums and I don't know, soon we're probably gonna cryogenically freeze them and shoot them into space. <laughs> The Epic, of, the Epic of Gilgamesh ultimately ends with its protagonist failing to achieve immortality. Spoiler alert for a 3,000-year-old myth, by the way. <laughs> but in a way, his story achieved immortality because we still know about it today. I mean, lots of things from back then were lost. All because ancient Babylonians were retelling the story so much over and over again, and then a different ancient Babylonian decided to write it down because it meant something to them. And then again, you know, projecting a little bit the idea that stories mean so much to people. 
It might have gathered from some of my earlier statements, but I wasn't a really shining beacon of normalcy growing up. <laughs> I think most people would have called me a lonely child, but I almost disagree because loneliness requires a sense of regret at the absence of company, and I was perfectly content in my state of isolation. <laughs> um, I mean, after all, people weren't really talking to me for a reason. I was nine, but I think I would have called myself deeply flawed. That sounds harsh to say to a nine-year-old, but now I would say something like perfectly imperfect. We all have our flaws, et cetera, et cetera. Insert motivational poster here. But that's a slightly positive spin to put on a not-so-positive past. I mean, as a kid, I always had to be the smartest in the room. I always had to speak first and loudest. Um, I hated being wrong. I hated losing. Not at all, like I am now. And <laughs> all I ever wanted to talk about was the stuff I liked. Star Wars, My Little Pony, comic books, nothing else mattered. Nothing at all. <laughs> In hindsight, I can recognize all of this as traits of undiagnosed autism. But at the time, I didn't have those words. These were just parts of me, and I had to contend with that. Like I said, I, I wasn't a difficult kid. I didn't feel I was a lonely kid, but... All the wonderful adults in my life, my parents, my teachers, they worried about me. I just never understood why they worried, though, because when I was too weird, too annoying, too whatever to find a home with any of my peers, I found that home in fiction, stories, imagination. There's a very ironic parallel between my life at the ages of five and 15. At age five, I was locked inside my room, reading ravenously, um, alone, but content. Age 15, I was once again locked inside my room, this time because of the pandemic, yes, the dreaded P word, and I was lonelier than ever, as I'm sure you can all relate to. So of course, I went right back to all my old coping mechanisms, TV, books, movies, comics. Hell, I got into audio drama over the course of the, pod of, of the pandemic. It's, it's really good, you guys. You should check it out sometime. <laughs> But something new also happened. Um, in my loneliness and in my alienation during the pandemic, I began to write. I mean, I'd tried before, but nothing substantial came of it. I'd always get bored and move on before I could finish anything. Except this time. This time, I had an idea. I made an outline for a script, and I actually finished it. <laughs> Plot twist. Um, and it's sitting real proud on my shelf right now. It's barely held together with staples because of how long it ended up being. Um, and its sequel is sitting right by its side. I had a lot of free time on my hands. <laughs> so, yes, we do preserve stories for the sake of posterity, tradition, historical records, all that boring junk. But it's also because, like me, in my loneliness and in my alienation, I felt motivated to create something that I could share with other people, that they could laugh at and enjoy and think about, and that could prove that I wasn't lonely and alienated. Those kinds of intense feelings, that need for companionship, has been motivating the way that we keep stories alive for centuries and centuries. And I've been using stories as an example of what the products of our imagination can mean to us as a society, how they can impact our culture. But I mean, it's not just all us fanciful, artsy-fartsy types that really value imagination. I mean, science. Everybody thinks it's a no fun, all logical, all facts, all the time kind of profession, but a key part of the scientific method is just the use of hypothesis. That's just an idea that a scientist has, and it's an idea based in fact, but it's still just an idea. And as much as me and certain people in charge right now might not always get along or agree, um, I can't deny that a big part of government and social change in general is being able to imagine a future better than the present we live in. Which is hard in these unprecedented times, as you might have guessed. It's easy to make the judgment that having an overactive imagination is a bad thing, that it makes you distracted and paranoid, and I sympathize with that. Trust me, my mother and my sister both suffer from anxiety, and it is a nightmare roller coaster to watch them catastrophize everything that could go wrong. <laughs> But I think that's a very Victorian line of thinking in a lot of ways. In very literal ways. I mean, the Victorians thought that an overactive imagination was a sign of madness. They would have thought that me, in my loneliness, finding comfort in fiction was crazy. But the Victorians were hypocrites and we all know it. 
I mean, Dracula and Frankenstein and Wuthering Heights and every other controversial creative work of the time, that was resonating with those Victorians that they so stigmatized their topics. And now we still have them today, preserved. I have a copy of Dracula up on my shelf that I bought from a charity shop. <sighs> they were always finding comfort in these stories, whether they like to admit it or not. Many will find comfort in stories they have before me, and they will after me. I mean, Homer's myth survived long enough for W.B. Yeats to write a poem about it. And then that poem survived long enough for my mom to read it and to name me Lita. That's all. <laughs>